It is an honor and a privilege to be back at C3. Many of you don't know that C3 was actually the site of the first Zen center in Western Michigan. It was called the White Sands Zen Center, and we met downstairs in the basement in one of the meeting rooms. Also, C3 was where I was ordained to be on staff. I was ordained by Bishop John Shelby Spong, our patron bishop, when he made one of his trips through town. So it feels in many ways that I'm back home. And I see so many familiar faces, and I don't know why it is, but none of you look older, and I do. The theme that you've chosen for this period, I understand, is the earth. Now, in order for me as a Buddhist monk to talk about these kind of concepts, there are certain Buddhist terms that some of you may be aware of, some of you may not, but I, I just need to bring them up. One is the term Dharma. Dharma is simply a term that encapsulates all of the teachings of the Buddha. The term Sangha. If I were at the temple this morning, where I usually am on Sunday morning, you all would be considered the Sangha. It's the gathering. But not just you, we consider in Buddhism the world to be our Sangha. In Buddhism, we also believe in the beginningless and endless nature of all things. We believe that this thing that I call a self is simply an illusion. When I talk about the self or myself, all of these connotations having to do with ego arise. But if I can see this construct that I call self, nothing more than a, an illusion that I've created with my mind, that makes it simpler to understand the interconnectedness of all things. I gave a Dharma talk about a month ago at the temple. Our temple is right downtown in uh, Grand Rapids on Division and Wealthy which is not a real affluent period, uh, section of town. Um, there are several soup kitchens, a lot of homeless people. On a Sunday morning, it's not unusual to find a homeless person sleeping in our, our entryway or in the back parking lot. And there's always, when I pull off the exit ramp, to get onto Wealthy Street from 131, there are always uh, people wanting money and uh, homeless, veterans, it doesn't matter. And what is so crucial and critical that I keep in mind each step of the way is that I am them. They are me. 
I am you. And like it or not, you're me. You're stuck with me whether you want to be or not. When I look at the beginningless, endless nature of all things and look at the I as the we, that changes everything in how I be. The talk I gave about a month ago was uh, Buddhism. Knowing, doing, being. And there are three types of people who typically call themselves Buddhists. Now, I didn't know it until I became more involved in Buddhism, which began at C3. I didn't know it but basically, I have been Buddhist all my life. I just didn't realize it. So, the first type of person who calls themselves a Buddhist knows about Buddhism. They know about it. I'm Buddhist. I read it in a book. Or I heard a seminar by... So and so. So I'm Buddhist. I know about it. The second type are those people who attempt to live, for the most part, based on Buddhist tenets, the belief system of Buddhists. Now, what is the main goal? You see, Buddhism has what we call our foundational truths, four noble truths. What's the first noble truth? Life is suffering. That's the first noble truth. Do I have any disagreements on that? Can I get an amen? Life is suffering. Here's the second noble truth. The basis of suffering, most typically, is ignorance greed, and anger. That's what creates most suffering in our lives. Our ignorance, our greed, or our anger. The third noble truth is that there is a path that leads out of suffering. And that path is known as number four, the Noble Eightfold Path. Now you can look any of these things up online. And there's tons and tons and tons of in information and tens and tens and thousands of thousands and thousands of, of pages of uh, Dharma, of teachings. Okay? But the Noble Eightfold Path has things like right speech, Right livelihood, right thought, right action, and some others. Now, in Buddhism, we also believe that no one is coming to save us. So where then, the when we talk about the Noble Eightfold Path, where does this stuff we call right come from? It comes from in here, when you do the really hard work of deep heart excavation and see yourself as you truly are, call yourself by your true names, and then work consistently on improving. You are the determining factor. No one else is. The word right, like right concentration, which is meditation, is often changed with correct, the word correct, or mindful. And so that is the path that leads out of suffering. Now, 
there's knowing Buddhism, then there's doing Buddhism, but then there's being Buddhist. What does that mean? That is the full internalized recognition that there are literally zero degrees of separation between you and me. Zero degrees of separation between me and Saddam Hussein, me and Donald Trump, me and Thich Nhat Hanh. There is no difference. We are the we are. Now in the Bible you read about, you know, I am the great I am. In the Buddhist sense, I am the great we are. Because of that lack of separation. Now, I brought this up when we did our, our little session before we, we came in here. Uh, that was fascinating. We got into some fascinating discussions. But there's an object, those of you who are there, don't give it away. There's an object that has 1.5 billion electrons, 1.5 billion times 1.5 billion times 1.5 million. You can do the math if you want. Electrons moving at a speed of, of approximately 1,700 kilometers per second. You know what that object is? It's the average human being. It's us. Now, do you think there's any difference between all these electrons that are moving around in me and the ones that are moving around in you? And what happens when I take your hand? Then what happens to all those electrons? Oh, my hands are freezing, aren't they? Oh, yes. Yes. What happens when we touch one another? I am made up of electrons, neutrons. I am made up of energy. I am made up of wind, water, fire, the earth. There is no separation. And when I recognize that, it changes my relationship with everything. The poem by Thich Nhat Hanh, if you have a chance, look it up online. It's called Please Call Me By My True Names because it's based on a true story. When he was in Plum Village, word got back to the headquarters, the Buddhist headquarters in Paris, uh, where Plum Village, Plum Village is, is near Paris, and that a group of pirates had boarded, boarded a boat of immigrants and they were killing people and raping uh, young girls and a father tried to intervene for on his daughter's behalf and he was killed and thrown overboard and the daughter threw herself overboard and committed suicide basically that way. And when that news reached Paris, Thich Nhat Hanh couldn't sleep. He just couldn't sleep. And as he lie awake, actually in, a, in meditation, he saw in his mind this girl. He saw the pirates. He saw thousands of babies being born in Thailand. And because they didn't have proper teaching, growing up to be those pirates. And recognizing the pirate 
in himself and recognizing that girl who committed suicide in himself and recognizing the arms merchant selling weapons to Uganda in himself and recognizing that child with legs and arms as thin as bamboo sticks as part of himself. Being Buddhist means you are one. There's that, that old Buddhist joke. What did, the, what did the monk say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. I know it's a sick joke, but it fits. Okay? We actually see ourselves, believe ourselves to be, and cannot extricate ourselves from everything that is. Now, many of the tribal cultures, I think, really, really got this right. Okay, we had this discussion earlier, too. The American Indians had a special connection with the earth and the animals and the sky and the plants. They had a special uh, a connection when they when they killed an animal. Before, as they killed an animal, they would actually literally apologize to the animal that was being killed. But every part of that animal was used to what? The calling, really, of all Buddhists. What? What is? What, what's our goal? What's a Buddhist goal? To relieve the suffering of all sentient beings. That's the goal. In order to do that, you can't know or do Buddhism. You must be, at your core, the living essence of the interconnectedness of all living things. I am the earth. A couple of weeks ago, I was up at uh, up north at a, a lake house that's been in our family for 65 years now. And uh, my grandparents had it. They passed it on to my parents who passed it on to my three sisters and I. And um, uh, when you're up, uh, any of you who own a lake house or a cottage know that it's nothing but work. It's always work. You know, every once in a while you get to go play in the water, but it's work. And this year, the reeds growing up in the lake were overgrowing everything. And so I assigned the task to myself that as I, I went down there between our neighbor's dock and our dock and the next dock over, that I would pull the weeds so the children would have a, a place to swim. Um, it took me two days. I filled up five 55-gallon uh, big trash bags. And then I took them out into the woods and scattered them so that they would return to the earth, okay, and uh, be part of the earth. But as I'm standing in water about up to my knees and I'm pulling these weeds, <laughs> you want to hear something really, really weird? I was talking to them. Who the hell talks to weeds? I did. I was just, it was sunny, and I was pulling weeds, and I was talking to them, you know, and why? Because I'm connected to them. That sand on the bottom that my, my feet were sinking into, I'm a part of that. That water, the breeze that would come through, the sun that was beating down on this bald head. I am a part of all of that, and all of that is a part of me. I am a part of all that is the earth. 
and the earth is a part of all that is we. I invite you to keep that in mind as you leave this place today and moving forward. A question, the question I wrote on the little board over there in the, in the other room, I asked them to consider this question. How old is your hand? In our um, refuge commitments every Sunday morning, we have a one chant called Refuge Commitments. And it says, I vow to live simply and sanely with content with just a few possessions. I vow to um, engage in mindful breathing and looking deeply into things. On the surface, this is just a hand. But look deeply into that hand and ask yourself, when was my hand born? I think you'll find that the answer is, my hand has always been and always will be. At this point in time, it just manifested itself as a hand. It could have manifested itself as a tree, as a plant, as water, as soil, all of those things of which I am made. May you be well. May you be, you be at peace. May you go from here with